Welcome everyone. It is Ishak Abla and this is Dream Church. It's so good to be with you Dream Church. If you are first time watching this program, you know that this is Dream Church. All nations, all people, all tribes, all color, everybody is welcome. There is no single outcast for this church, no platform business, uh, no personalities, no such thing, celebrities. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And we are just gathering here today to have a church service. And I have a special treat for you. If you don't know me, I am a former Muslim. I got saved on the day I was going to kill myself. I was a fanatical Muslim woman. Now I am radical for Jesus Christ. And I want all of you to know he is the only way to the Father. He is the only way to God. He is the only way to heaven. And today I just want to tell you great things that God is doing for Dream Church. We have right now 600,000 followers from Pakistan. And we have 252,000 people following from Afghanistan. We are reaching to places through social media, only social media, plus satellite TV, to the places that people cannot carry a Bible. If people became a Christian in their place, in their country, they can be executed. And there are people right now watching us from Pakistan and they start writing down, I am from Pakistan, I am here today at Dream Church and I just want to welcome you. We have people watching this broadcast right now from Saudi Arabia. We welcome you. There are people from Egypt right now. We have over 500,000 people from Egypt. And I just want to welcome you today. You are welcome. We have 200,000 people from America. Welcome. All people, all nations, all tribes. This is God's heart. And this is his dream. And today I have a very special guest with me, Lord Robert Edmiston. He's a businessman, he's an entrepreneur, and more than that, he's a wonderful Christian who wants to see the lost get saved, who wants to see the billions of people on the face of the earth know about Jesus Christ. And he has a ministry, big, large ministry that he has founded, and name is Christian Vision. We just want to welcome you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with me today. It's my pleasure. How is everything? Uh, everything's been good. We've been traveling quite a bit and yes. seeing our various works in different part of, parts of the country. And we just recently had a meeting of our executives in Dallas. So that's why we're here now in New York um, for uh, another conference, Movement Day. Yes, wonderful. But recently I received an email from you. You were just sharing from your heart about persecuted Christians. And we see it all over the world. I receive, we, our ministry receives about a thousand messages a day. And most of them also from persecuted Christians. And we pray for them. This is my heart as well. And you were sharing your heart in your email about how we call Islamophobia, homophobia. But we haven't got to a place that giving our full attention to persecution of the Christians, the biggest persecution, probably one of the biggest at least I can say, and genocide, murders of Christians are happening today, right now, and we are not paying enough attention, you have said. What would you like to share about that? Well, um, I've been very concerned about the whole issue of persecution of Christians. Uh, we understand Christians are being killed every hour of every day somewhere in the world. And largely this goes unnoticed. But in addition to that, and, and, and of course you can call that genocide and even more severe terms than Christophobia. But there's also all sorts of other elements of Christophobia where in society they're trying to put Christianity into something you just do privately. You know, you privately can worship, but you can't do anything about your faith in public. Uh, certain jobs you're not allowed to hold, like registrars, if you're a Christian. And, uh, you know, we have these terms, Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, and of course, we shouldn't persecute anyone on the basis, basis of their beliefs. But when it comes to Christianity, it seems anything goes. And there are some great organizations highlighting human rights abuses, but the general day-to-day -day marginalization of Christians is not being recognized. And I believe it, if you name it, you shame it. And, and by naming it Christophobia, we then start to tell people uh, what's happening. And then when somebody makes a comment, oh, you're just a Christian, well, you can say, well, you're Christophobic. 
And so we give it a tag that Christians can use. Now that the word has existed before and has been used occasionally, but it is not in common use. And I'd like to see the, the press uh, and people in political circles and ministry circles using that term much more frequently so it becomes part of our everyday language and we can identify for what it is. Do you think that there's any reason behind this? I, I can, of course, call it a spiritual attack, but is it on purpose that this, people are closing their eyes to Christophobia? I don't think the word has been generally used, so uh, I think by us doing what we can to bring it into general usage, it will help. Um, I, and I think there has been an increasing awareness, but, you know, for instance, when all the problems happened in Iraq, we talked about the Yazidis, yes. but we didn't talk much about the Christians. But the Christians were also being persecuted and killed. And, and uh, you know, we uh, understand Jesus said we've got to forgive our enemies, and Christians have been uh, great at forgiving and turning other cheek, but sometimes that can be abused, and the world just takes it for granted. You can do what you like to Christians, because they won't complain, they won't do anything about it. I do think we should give it a name, and Christophobia uh, is the name that I think best fits. In fact, uh, the word phobia, uh, is a bit of an odd word, but that's what the world has chosen to name Islamophobia, homophobia, uh, you know, xenophobia, so Christophobia seems appropriate. But uh, I don't think anyone should have a phobia about Christians. Christians have done nothing but good throughout the centuries. Uh, education came through Christian organizations. Hospitals and health came through Christian organizations. The founding fathers of America were Christians. The founding documents of your country uh, were made by Christians. And so Christians have a great heritage. And whenever you see a Christian country, you see tolerance and acceptance of other people and acceptance of other ways of life. In many other countries, that tolerance does not exist. So, uh, and in fact, you, you can't build a church in some places. Uh, I regard that as Christophobic, uh, because why uh, can you build other places of worship, but you can't build a church? And there are Christians who are not allowed to meet uh, in public or pray in public or do anything uh, like that. So, and, and now in some countries, there's even a ban on Christians doing things on the internet. This is something that's happened quite recently. Uh, so, there is a lot of this Christophobia around, but as we see that happening, our nations become poorer, and, and we see our standards dropping, and we see a lot of violence and, and problems in society, and problems in the world, and we know that Jesus is the answer to those problems, um, but as we, we've got to start holding up a standard and saying, uh, this is not acceptable. And we've got to start saying, look, that's Christophobic. Absolutely. Jesus said, they hate me and they will hate you. So they persecute me, they will persecute you. If you believe in me, if you follow me, you are going to receive the treatment that I have been receiving. But as I have been uh, hearing from Lord Edmiston, this, this doesn't mean that we have to allow abuse. This is completely different than in our daily lives. Even we are seeing right now in the Western world, I recently went to Middle Eastern countries and I have met with refugees, Christian refugees. They left their homes, they left everything. They became homeless because they refused to deny Jesus Christ. They wanted to give their everything and they are living a sacrificial, suffering life for Jesus Christ. But if you are living in the, West, in the Western world today, don't take it for granted and don't think that this is not going to happen to you. And as a matter of fact, it is happening right now in our midst when you go to a public place to pray, when you want to hold hands in a school campus to use the name of Jesus Christ. I promise you, you will be persecuted. I personally experienced persecution, not in the Middle East only but I experienced persecution in Europe and in America as a Christian, not only as a Muslim. Today, I just want to invite you to think over where this is going. And I want to turn to you, Lord Edmiston. What can we do? What more we can 
everybody hearing right now can do for this? Well, I think the most important thing is Christians need to wake up. Yes. Because I think a lot of Christians uh, do not share their faith. Uh, they go to church and sometimes they are entertained uh, by what is happening in church. I was recently in China and uh, the house church there, which expanded so rapidly, has five basic things they always did. Read their Bible every day, pray every day, expect a miracle every day, make sure you tell someone else about the gospel every day. And thank God. And thank God, even in your suffering, wow. for what he's doing. Wow. Those are powerful things. Yes, and, and their church expanded despite persecution and despite problems. Persecution, actually, has always been the thing that has created the church to grow. Mm -hmm. The reasons are, I think, twofold. One, because anyone who's peripheral, who's just coming to the church for entertaining, isn't going to come. So you're only going to get true Christians coming at a time when there's persecution. And I've seen that in the Middle East. The Christians there pay a huge price. People like yourself, uh, converting from Islam, would pay a huge price. So they have to be serious. And so I think that's the most important thing. And therefore, they're not interested in all the periphery. They, they really want to know, and they really have to know, Jesus for themselves. That's so true. And we see, I, I was just meeting with someone. I, would, I cannot even give the name. I cannot tell you what it is. But I, I asked him, can I share this with my viewers without giving any names, without giving any countries uh, on Dream Church? And he said, go ahead, because we have no fear for our lives. What they are doing right now, it, it is just mind-blowing. They are signing up missionaries. You are hearing me right. They are signing up missionaries to go and deliver Bibles to ISIS members. And these are the believers. They know that most likely they are not going to come back. And these are the people that they sign up to go and give Bibles to ISIS members, knowing that after they give the Bibles and they will be killed. And they say, we go. There are people out there that in the parts of the world, that their faith is so different than maybe your faith. I have a guy writing to us every single day from a place that you can't even carry a Bible, and he is daily leading at least five to ten by himself people to the Lord in his country. This is, this is an amazing walk, folks. This is an amazing walk. And now, I, I have been meeting with people in the Western world, and we had this big strategical meeting a few months ago, and people were asking, all these brilliant people, theologians, we were sitting together and asking, how are we going to do this? And we were f trying to figure out these huge ministerial things. And then I asked them, did you pray about this? Maybe we should stop and pray for an hour and come back. And do you know what I said was a great offense to them? Come on, talking about prayer and asking, did you pray about this, was an offense to these giant people in the, in the major organizations or in the Western world. Where we are right now, here, and where these precious people are at, are completely black and white difference. So how can we wake up? You talk about waking up, and I love, this is my major subject, revival. Bring the fire down, Lord to a place that we don't care for how we look, what our reputation is, and what kind of price we are going to pay for. But how do you bring people that are so much sleeping and they have a hard time even praying daily, five minutes a day, how do you bring them to a wake-up place? You know, I'm trying, but I want to know, do you have any answers for that? I wish I did. <laughs> um, I think it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And maybe circumstances in life. You see, whenever the children of Israel got into trouble yes. and they were uh, inflicted by their enemies, they turned to God. Hmm. And then pretty soon after God resolved things for them and things went well for a while, then they started forgetting. Hmm. And this is the way of human nature, unfortunately. And sadly, it, it sometimes takes that kind of issue. Uh, let me say, though, um, God is able to do the most incredible things. For instance, we, we're talking to people in the Middle East and they're saying for years we've wanted to, 
do something with Muslim people and we couldn't get in, the countries are closed, it's very difficult. And now they say there's a wave of them coming to us. Millions are coming into Europe and the churches are there helping them and giving them food and clothing and help and ministry because many of them are very traumatized people yes. and the churches are there and suddenly they're seeing Christians aren't terrible people. Mm. Christians are there to help them and, and there's one church I know in, in Sweden, in Uppsala, it has a huge sign outside its building, a massive sign saying, welcome refugees. Awesome. Uh, and 60% of all their converts yes. are from uh, Islamic faith. Uh, so th it's, a, it's an incredible thing that's happening with the refugees coming. And uh, many of them have also experienced a lot of problems uh, with uh, the Sunnis fighting the Shias and, and ISIS fighting other ones. And, and, and so they've lost friends and families and loved ones and their buildings. And they're asking lots of questions. Their, their hearts are open uh, and they are in desperate need. Uh, and so I think uh, God is able to do something ex incredible that, that we could never even imagine. Uh, for years we've imagined we had to go there. Yes. Instead, they're coming to us. Mm. So it's, it's a real change of circumstance. I agree. I mean, whether we can see it as an opportunity or we can see it as a threat. And for us to see it as a threat, we don't know where we are standing with Jesus Christ. But if we see it as an opportunity, then our perspective is different and our relationship, our approach to them will be different. And I completely agree with Lord Edmiston that we need to see it as an opportunity like those churches. There are so many pastors are watching Dream Church right now and they are asking me, a lot of, many of you are writing to me and say, tell, asking me, what can we do with the refugees? Start maybe English as a second language classes. Start about parenting class, culture classes to help them to adopt and learn about your culture. And so you can also learn about their culture. There are so so many things that you can do to open your doors without having any fear to so these people, these precious people. Remember, Jesus died for them too. Jesus died on the cross for them. Christian vision has... Well, may I just come oh, back yes. on that point? Sure. Um, you see, it is both a problem and an opportunity. Yes. And there will be some problems for sure. There will probably be plenty of problems. But the fact is they're coming anyhow. And so we have to accept that millions have come into Europe. Mm. That's a fact. We can't just, uh, just say you don't exist. They do, and they are there. So we have to grasp the opportunity. But here's another thing that's very interesting that somebody told me. Jesus was a refugee. Yes. All the apostles were refugees. They had to escape. So actually doing good things for refugees and strangers is totally in line with scripture. Of course, we're, there's many reasons to be concerned and in amongst some of them may be ISIS. It's true. Uh, and in fact, I met a former CIA guy who's a former Muslim who's Christian now. And he said um, he does an interview for ideology. So we can be wise and, and yes. interviewing these people for ideology. But the ones who are genuine, we should do what we can to help them um, because you always remember the people who helped you when you were in desperate need. And if we want to get uh, them to understand that Christianity is about loving your neighbor and doing good to others, what better chance than now? Yes, I, I agree. We have to be wise. We have to be wise, but we also cannot close our eyes. And we, we need to, I, I just want to invite you to pray this dangerous prayer. I pray dangerous prayers. And one of them is, I want you, God, at any price, at any cost. This is a dangerous prayer. We serve a big God. But for you to pray that, because God brought my heart in a place after so, for so long praying this prayer, and he started giving me a new vision and new perspective. As Lord Edmiston said, we can see things as problems, but every problem comes with an opportunity. And how we react to it, how we respond to it can make the difference. Today, I just want to invite you to pray about that. But most, first and foremost, if you feel like you have been sleeping, if you feel like you have been going through a dry season in your life, do you know that I have been walking with the Lord for 16 years? My first two years were a joke. 
and I don't want to even go down there. But after that, rest of the time, I never had a single dry day in my life. Dry day with the Lord in my life. And this is my prayer for you today. If you are watching this broadcast and if you're a Christian and you're, if you are sitting and sitting and sitting and years are passing by, you are missing it. You are missing opportunities after opportunities after opportunities. And then you want to be used and you want to glorify God. There's a part in you, there's something in your heart that you want to do greater things than what you are doing right now. And it is possible. Start praying and start saying, I, wanna, I want your will. I want you at any price, at any cost. This is a dangerous prayer. But I suggest that you start praying this. If there's something in you that right now, waking up, and you feel the fire is igniting within you right now, 